How do you how do you feel they did with the accuracy of uh, of portraying us? Um, not particularly well, to be honest. Um, well, um, it was shit, really, wasn't it? To be funny. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Uh, I, can kind of, I can kind of relate to the what's the. Hello, everybody, and welcome to a very special episode of Stories from the Trail. Uh, we like to do things from time to time that are different. In fact, I think way back at the beginning of the show, one of the things I said was that we kind of like to not really have a format. Sometimes we interview a guest. Sometimes we just have a topic. Tonight, we're doing something we've never done before, and we are going to... What I've been saying online is we're going to break down this film, but since it's a hiking movie, we are going to shake down A Walk in the Woods. This is the movie that uh, started the hiking craze for a ton of people, both you know as a film and as a book. And what we've done is at some point within the last week, in fact, for most of us, just within the last few days, we've watched the movie so that it's fresh in our minds. And we're going to go around the table and give it a serious... Uh, you know, we're still going to have fun. There's still going to be poop talk. But when I say serious, um, I mean, we're not just going to spend 90 minutes bashing this movie, you know, and, and and you know, I think a lot of people might hear that and think, well, why would you why would you bash a walk in the woods? Uh, we, we love this movie. And it's one of the reasons why I picked this to be our first movie that we do a shakedown of, because there are tons and tons of people who absolutely love this movie. And if you believe Facebook or Reddit, there are tons and tons of people who absolutely hate this movie. And I think it deserves a lot of attention regardless of how you feel about it. So we're going to go around the table and we're each going to give uh, you know, our, our serious take on this movie. And uh, I'm going to try to make this as fun as possible. So I think probably the first thing we want to we want to do is go around and, and ask everybody if this is their first viewing or if you'd seen it before. And let's do that as a way of introducing our hosts, just in case anyone's listening for the first time. So uh, I'm Green Giant, and I've seen this movie a bunch of times, or probably not a bunch. I think this is probably like my third or fourth viewing, and I've read the book, I think twice, maybe two and a half times. And I'll you know talk a little bit more about my history with the book and movie first. But uh, why don't we start with Reptar, who's uh, almost always with us. Uh, how's it going this evening, Reptar? Things are going good, man. Uh, yeah, I just watched the movie again. Uh, the first time that I watched it, I was actually in the middle of a through hike when it came out, and we zeroed in town one night and went to a movie theater and saw it. And yeah, I I still think it's horrible. <laughs> okay. <laughs> um, had you had you read the book before? Yeah, prior to hiking the AT, I read the book. I thought the book was much better, although I wasn't a huge fan of it. Okay. I know that a lot of people love the book, uh -huh. but I it just didn't do it for me. Okay. And we'll take a deep dive into both the book and the movie, focusing mostly on the movie in a little bit. I'd like to hear more about you know why you liked and like disliked both. Uh, but first, I want to talk to another regular guest that we have on the show, Mr. Keith Foskett, uh, trail name Fozzie. Fozzie is joining us from across the pond this evening, where it is very late. I'm sorry to keep you up this evening. Um, that's quite all right as usual. It's quarter past midnight, but uh, I'm feeling good. I have a coffee. Um, I have read the book. I read the book in the 90s um, when I first heard of the Appalachian Trail. Um, loved the book. Um, I think I read it again a few years later, I think just before uh, I went out to hike it, just as kind of like a refresher. Um, I watched the movie, I believe the year it came out, um, and I watched it again um, this evening. What's Overall, your... mm -hmm. I think just as kind of like a, a rough sort of guide, I'd probably give it about a 7 out of 10. Okay. All right. That's that's actually pretty good. Yeah. What, what are some... I figure a 7 or above is, 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 is generally okay. A 6 is kind of getting towards the poor side, so... A seven is kind of like it's sort of floating in the middle. It didn't sort of blow my world or anything, but I don't think it's a bad film. 
Okay. And, and you know, just so, because we don't really know too much about your taste in movies. Like, what's what's another movie that you'd give a seven to? Or better yet, let me ask you this. What's a ten? What's a ten in your book? In your book of movies? Um, the 40-Year-Old Virgin. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, the best boy. movie ever made. I mean, why did that movie not get an Oscar? They're they're like bags of sand, right? <laughs> <laughs> um, okay. What would I give as a ten? Well, I would give the Forty Year Old Virgin a ten. Um, really? I'd give, really? Okay. I would give the Shawshank Redemption a ten. Okay. I was thinking the same thing. That was exactly the movie that I was thinking I would give a ten. Yeah, I, I think. I mean, I. I I'd, I'd love the Shawshank Redemption. The thing about the Shawshank Redemption is I've yet to speak to someone that's seen the Shawshank Redemption that didn't absolutely love it. I've never met anyone that said, no, that's a bad movie. Oh, it's just, it's an incredible film. Um, I'm yeah. pretty sure that it's sitting at the number one spot right now in, was it the American Film Association's list of like top films of all time? I forget who makes this list, but it's widely regarded as the best film uh, the best film of all times. It's so good you can't even call it a movie. You have to call it a film. What I like about it is it's one of those films. I mean, I think it's quite long. I don't know how long Shawshank Redemption is. I'm guessing it's like it might be over two hours. I don't know. But it's, I can't really explain it. It's one of those movies where, like, about four or five occasions through the film, it feels like they're winding it up, like it's going to end. And then that scene kind of ends and they come in another scene and it all sort of starts up again and then it all sort of builds up and then dies down and you think, oh, it's going to end. And then it all starts up again. And it does it about five times through the movie. But I don't that, know how to explain it. but Right, but but that never gets really gets annoying either. Like it, No, it not works. at all. No, it's, it's, it's because, like, like I say, you think it's going to finish and you're kind of getting it a bit sad because it's like a great movie. And then you're like, <laughs> oh, it hasn't finished. They start, you know, it's, it's, it, it's all going to start up again sort of thing. It's a bit of a strange one. I'm sure there's a technical movie director's term for it, but um Yeah. And yeah, Reptar says in the chat two hours, twenty two minutes, and of course based on a uh, a book written by Stephen King, of all people. That's correct. I forgot about that. It was, yeah. Yeah, a lot of people discount that. I think that was when he was writing under his pen name and it was uh one of one of the Richard Bachman books. But uh yeah, awesome. Awesome movie. Way better it is. way, way better than a walk in the woods oh yeah <laughs> um yeah and gamera in the chat cor- is correcting me it's a short story uh, by stephen king so um and we have one more voice who will be joining us this evening uh one that you're probably all familiar with if you've heard the show before voldemort who's running a few minutes late she'll be uh she'll be joining us here in a little bit but um you know just on the off chance that someone is not familiar with a walk in the woods. Um, let's talk a little bit of, first about what that is. Um, so, a walk in the woods was originally a book written by uh, written by Bill Bryson, and Bill Bryson is a travel writer who is from the United States, and he spent uh, I think like ten years living in England, and he's he's written a bunch of books. Um, you know, Walk in the Woods is probably the most famous, especially you know for those of us in the hiking community. I've read a couple other books. By Bill Bryson, such as uh, there's one, I think it's called like a brief history of everything, a brief history of nearly everything. Uh, Some of his other travel books are, uh, and I'm I'm trying to do this all from memory, but he wrote something called something about a sunburnt country, which is his book about a road trip across Australia. Um, You know, a lot of road trip books too. But um, I wonder if you guys have, have you read any uh, other books by Bill Bryson? I haven't. Um, Walk in the Woods is the uh, is is the only one I've read, which is kind of surprising because um, okay. I I did enjoy the book, but more importantly, just his um, it's kind of it's kind of a weird one to describe unless you've read it. I mean, it's obviously about him hiking on the Appalachian Trail, but it's mm-hmm. the thing that um, I like about Bryson is, I mean, it, a it makes me laugh. Um, and B, it's just his uh, his observations on life. Like he will take a simple situation, for example, I don't know, he's eating breakfast in a diner or whatever, and he'll like start talking about 
I don't know the guy clip the guy flipping burgers, and before you know it, two minutes later, you you, you just laughing. <laughs> right. So he's got this uncanny knack of taking a normal situation and just turning it uh, into an amusing situation. So it's not so much a uh, a book about hiking the AT. It's more. I don't know. It's just it, it just it just kind of makes me laugh. I it just made me laugh. Yeah, and it's interesting because Bill. Uh, kind of has two he has two styles really two different styles that he writes in one is you know that comedic narrative that you you describe where he's you know he's telling a story just describing a simple scene and doing it in a way that actually can make you laugh as a reader but he also is good at you know like tens and tens of pages of detailed what would otherwise be boring exposition so a walk in the woods in addition to being a story about his time on the at is also a, a lot of that book is about the trail itself you know he talks he has a whole chapter that talks just about the national forest service he doesn't have good things to say about the national forest service either he has an entire chapter about the flora and fauna in the smokies he'll go on for paragraphs at a time describing you know, why the chestnuts are disappearing along the East Coast. So he's he's very good at at teaching and as well. And some of his other books, like I mentioned before, uh oh, Home is another one. It's called Home. Um so a brief history of nearly everything is kind of a series of like ten to twenty page essays where uh you know Bill interviews like he interviews a paleontologist and then he interviews someone who works with vaccines and then interviews a chemist and just basically talks about everything starting from the big bang up to, you know, like the invention of the car. And it's full of, you know, interesting trivia and, you know, things that you, you know, didn't know. Um, he can write about, for example, in his book home, he writes about why, men's sport coats have five buttons on the collar that are on the co- on the uh, the cuff that don't actually do anything like there's a whole history of like why houses have hallways in them it's the weirdest shit but he's good about at writing stuff like that and making it making it interesting um what i find uh, uh slightly annoying about his comedic narrative style is that he tends to rely on uh, in my opinion, he tends to rely on like grumpy fish out of water style complaining. So a lot of the book, a lot of the humor that comes out of the the book version of A Walk in the Woods is, you know, like him struggling with a heavy backpack for the first time or curmudgeonly. That's yes. A booster in the chat says curmudgeonly. That's a good word to describe it. Um, you know, and some people some people don't like that. Uh, some people do. I think in the right situation, it can be funny and uh you know, in this book in particular, I think he gets it right sometimes, but in other places he doesn't. Well, as I always say, writing's like politics. You can't please all the people all the time. So, <laughs> right. Um, you know, you can you can kind of write, uh, I don't know, let's say an amusing situation, how you sort of perceive it or how you think the reader would find it funny or... Uh, another method of writing it but um like i said there's always going to be someone that doesn't find it funny or even if you're not trying to offend mm-hmm. people some people will be offended by it so you can never sort of please uh, everybody all of the time but um i think he does a pretty good job of, of, of pleasing the majority at least speaking of uh people who uh don't care about pleasing any people all of the all of the people all of the time that's a terrible introduction strike that from the record uh speaking of people megan is here <laughs> she's I arrived kn- <laughs> i knew that transition was coming because i've been lurking hello megan <laughs> lurking uh, quietly but hello. um so i'm a person who doesn't like pleasing people i, I, that, that- I don't know I was, I was trying to get at like you kind of don't really like, you don't really care what other people think, but I don't care, guys. I don't I'm even super, care. Oh, yeah, there's but, gotta be. Is that emo? Is that is that the stereotype? Yeah, and then I second guessed myself like mid word, and then just. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I care enough to be respectful to others, but your opinion about what I'm doing doesn't really matter to me. There you go. <laughs> 
Isn't that how we should all live our lives? I don't know. This part. I don't know. I kind of want my therapist to not have that attitude. <laughs> that's true. Nice. That's that's true. I guess uh therapy is a different world. That doesn't doesn't count. <sighs> Tell me about your childhood, I guess. <laughs> yeah. Oh, I oh. guess you could tell me about your feelings. Oh, your on your your, your mom, relationship with your mother. Fine. She accused me of painting with poop. <laughs> <laughs> this is what you miss when when you show up late. Um, I'm sorry. No, no, it's fine. We we were actually kind of just going around apologize. going around the table and, and uh, you know asking who's who's seen the movie prior to this viewing and or has read the book and what you think about it. Oh, well, I <laughs> I tried to read the book. So when I first showed up, you guys were talking about, you know, writing and, and the book specifically. I was like, oh, shit. Was I supposed to actually read the book for this? Like, did I, <laughs> did I not do my homework properly? No, you didn't have to. It wasn't just a walk in the woods. You had to read all of his books. Did you not do that? <laughs> I am sorely underprepared, if that is the case. Um, <laughs> no, I, I did try reading the books prior to um my hike in 2014 Mm -hmm. i was given actually multiple people gave me a copy of a walk in the woods attempted to read it but it wasn't what i was looking for at the time so i never finished it gotcha you guys skimmed the ending of it okay okay yeah the book yeah it, it wasn't what i was looking for at the time i was looking for Maybe less of a how-to guide, but some, I don't know. I really don't know what I was looking for. I guess I was trying to glean some insight that would help me in my hike because I was preparing for it and right. didn't help me. It wasn't what I wanted. When they stopped actually hiking um, or when there was like people like discarding trash or like breaking leave no trace ethics, which I obviously feel very strongly about, um, I kind of was like, well, this isn't what I want. Yeah. It's definitely not. Um, it's definitely not the sort of book you need to be reading if you if you're going to do a potential, if you're potentially through hiking and you want to do some kind of research on. Right. I don't know. You it's know, not what most preparatory research. Yeah, it's, it's not a. That that's not what it's all about. Um, I did I mean, watch the movie, it, right, but it's definitely not any. You, you you can sort of class it as, as as sort of research for your hike or pick up pointers yeah. or anything like that. Exactly. And I, I probably should at some point go back to the book and actually give it a good shot, like try reading it cover to cover. But uh, I don't really have a lot of time for spare reading um, because I do so much driving. I listen to things. There you go. That's a good idea. Podcast um, host who listens to podcasts. Oh, well, hey, <laughs> do you study? Do I study like while driving? Like do you listen to podcasts about how to podcast? You know, I haven't gone that nerdy yet, but yeah, those, I didn't even think of it as an option. Yeah, those things exist. It's almost as nerdy as I a normally pod- do news. As Do news. what? I, I do news podcasts. Oh, that's right. Yeah, we talked about that before. Podcasts yeah. and um, sometimes I'll listen to our podcast, uh, especially if, if there's like an episode where I, I didn't. Mm. I didn't make it because of work. I'll mm. listen to that. I've been listening to audiobooks recently as well. Oh wait! Like a bingeable thing. If you're if you're a fan of of this episode, wait till you hear what happens. Like thirty and like right. Well, I'm not going to spoil it. This one gets really good. Trust me. This episode. Yeah, the one we're in right now. The one we're in right now. So what you're saying is people should continue listening. Yeah, it gets really good in, in a or few it minutes. Gets I really, promise. Really good. Yeah. Sweet. Yeah. I can't wait. Yeah, Megan's going to say something so funny. St- trust me. Stick with us. She doesn't even know she's going to say something funny. Wait, wait, okay. We're here, just going to laugh at her expense. Okay, here she goes. Here it comes. Oh, no, wait. I'm thinking of some other show. Sorry. <laughs> oh, okay. Yeah. So, all right. So, there's there's no <laughs> way, there's no way that we could have, that we, you and I could have seen the movie prior to our, our, our hike uh, because right. they were filming it while we were on the trail. Correct. Was I? Yes. Yep. Yeah, and people were talking about it. It was a thing. Yes. Did you? Twenty fourteen. Did you guys see them filming it, or meet anybody that no. did? So no, we we did not. 
Um, so the you know, the book came out in 1998, and in 2005, uh, Robert Redford first announced his plans to make the movie. And there were a whole bunch of reasons why it didn't happen right away, but they basically sat on the script for 10 years. And principal filming began... Yeah, principal filming actually began, oh, look, May 9th, so 14, shooting in Los Angeles. So probably... You know, it was the day I started the trail. Interior shots and, and whatnot. But um, there's tons of exterior and on-location shots in this movie. There's you know a bunch of montages where you see places that are super familiar. They really, really did go to McAfee's Knob uh, and a bunch of other places. But I remember there was somebody, there was a girl on the trail who was a, you know, a few miles ahead of us whose trail name was Robert Redford. I do remember that. Yeah. <laughs> But we never met. I remember her. her. Actually, I don't know that she was a through hiker. I think she was doing a section, right? Right, and I think she was like cast as an extra in one of the scenes, which we'll talk about in a minute. But uh, yes, that's right. Yeah, so we were aware that it was going on. But... You know, at that shelter where I met her, that's where I lost my hand sanitizer. <laughs> <I'm>... <laughs> yeah, I was sanitizing my hands, and it fell into the abyss of a privy, and I couldn't get it out. I actually probably still on a flash drive somewhere have a picture of my hand sanitizer being held hostage by a privy like a bunch of surrounded by a bunch of poop and toilet paper you and, like, looking at my pictures like years after realizing like wow i can't believe i took a picture of the inside of a privy but i was so miffed that i lost my hand sanitizer that i don't know i was i felt like i had to take a picture okay cool yeah, sorry, I mentioned poop already. <laughs> no, that's People all right. People in the chat are like, oh, there it yep. is. We've already started the poop. Yep. <laughs> I, it wasn't intentional. It really was. That's where I met Robert Redford. So those two memories are now connected. Meeting Robert Redford, the hiker. You guys are falling in a privy. Gotcha. Derek, can I just say, I'm quite impressed with um, your your facts and figures and, and general trivia on this so far this evening. You've clearly done some research. I, as usual, have not done any. <laughs> well, uh, n nevertheless, I'm still glad you're here. Thank you. <laughs> glad you did your research, Gary. And we do need, to, obviously, someone needs to do some research because, uh, you know, this is a, it's, it's a professional show. <laughs> well, we, we are <laughs> trying we so our best. We know what we're talking about, even though we don't. We're trying very hard to, to portray ourselves in that, in that fashion. And I think we're coming really close, guys. We're almost there. <laughs> We just, we just need one. We just need one German cast member. <laughs> <laughs> That's the day I'm leaving then. <laughs> um, so, Megan, what, what did you think of, of the, the of the movie? Yeah, kind of did with the movie because I had not seen the movie until last week, like when we were planning to to talk oh, about so this this is your first so, time first time how exciting um and i also want to say i did something kind of similar with the movie that i did with the book i fell asleep in the oh. middle of it okay that's fine. like kind of like you know i stopped reading the book halfway through i also fell asleep in the middle of this movie uh-huh i not a great song then yeah i did not blame you one bit <laughs> so i I talked to a friend today about about this movie and I was trying to I was trying to be nice in describing it and the reasons that I fell asleep because I, I was obviously tired. But I said, you know, it wasn't super um what's that word? You know, it, it just wasn't riveting. And and she said right. And I said, Yeah, I, I guess no, I guess so, I guess so. <laughs> because it, it it was I mean, some of it was accurate, mm -hmm. but there were a lot of inaccuracies that I caught right up front and I, I think Kind of like, okay, I'm over it. You got a bunch of stuff wrong. Mentally, Mark's I kind of checked 10. out. What's that? Marks out of 10? 10. Um, I don't like giving anything a failing grade. So... What, you, you cut out one more time. I feel like we should put a drum roll in or something. <laughs> I hate giving failing grades, so... No, just kidding. I'm going to do it. Uh, I would give it a good five. Ooh. Okay. 
as, as a ab in the center because I'm really indifferent about it. Like I didn't dislike it. There are a few things that I like the fact that he went shopping first thing um, at a gear store mm-hmm. and Nick Offerman was there. So I was like, oh my God, <laughs> he's in this movie. I didn't know that. <laughs> and um, and Emma Thompson, I didn't know she was in that movie. Yeah. She's excited about that. So I was like, we're off to a really great start. Like this is great. And Kristen Schaal is in that movie. I feel like Emma Thompson was, was underutilized in this one. She was definitely underutilized, but I was like so ready here. It's like seeing her part in the beginning. I was so ready to hear more about the, the dynamic in relationships um, when someone decides to go live in the woods for five months. Like I was ready for that to be a consistent thing that happens throughout the movie that we, that we yeah. address. Yeah. Because they they really but then there are also those errors. So they kind of dive. They they it looks like you're going to get a deep dive into that at the start of the film, and then they just kind of leave you hanging for a while. Yeah, like I, I expected more of a dialogue behind, like, are you going? Why are you going? More of like a discussion there, right. which I'm sure. Or else there was more of a discussion there, and then as soon as that happened, we went right into like the errors of the of the shopping at the gear store. <laughs> Which I really, I need to point out. He lives in Hanover, New Hampshire in this movie. And in the gear store, Nick Offerman's wearing a a green vest. Okay. Like REI. Mm. Oh, yeah. And a little tag has like the little trees on it, kind of like an REI vest. There is not a single REI in the states of Maine, New Hampshire, or Vermont. What is? And that really ticked me off. What is there? There There is an EMS. EMS. That's it. I was trying to remember. There is an EMS up in, um, it's not in Hanover. It's in. Okay. Yeah, How so, could you which is know there's not a single REI in those states? Because I'm from Maine. I've lived in New Hampshire on the border of Vermont. And I've hiked all through the three states. Okay. Yeah. And, and or, me, me thinking you've done research as well. <laughs> <laughs> she, oh, yeah. No, no. I just, I, I just know that from experience. From when I was preparing for my hike and I wanted to go to a gear store. Recon. And I was looking for my own gear. EMS is the big retailer that's up here. And... Their selection, while I do like EMS as a company, um, they don't have as big of a selection as REI. And our closest REI currently is in um, is in Massachusetts. And Gazelle put in the chat, which is completely correct, there is an REI coming to North Conway, New Hampshire, in September. Mm. Don't have big gear stores. So honestly, when I was hiking, when I was preparing for my through hike, I if I didn't find what I wanted at EMS, I went to places like Cabela's. That sounds like an Italian alternate. restaurant. <laughs> Why would you go to an Italian restaurant for gear? <laughs> it's, um, it's like a hunting and fishing store. Oh, okay. Okay. Yeah, like you can, you can buy like some pretty intense guns there. All right. So I, I have... Back to the movie. That, I, was, that was my beef. Yeah. So I have two lists that I'm maintaining. We're going to visit these near the end of our discussion. I have a list... Sorry, did I of, dive into that too early? Nope, no, yeah. In fact, you just added something to the list. I have I have goofs and got its. So goofs, goofs and what? Goofs and got its. Like things they got it. Oh, you got it. They got it right. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, so we've got goofs and got its. And I, and you just added to the list of things that, that this movie got wrong. Nick Offerman's vest is the wrong color. Okay. Well, so that's yes. <laughs> that's he also recommended an eighty-five liter pack. Yeah, we're going to talk about that. In fact, why don't we why don't we do that? Let's let's get which to, was also an REI brand, so it was totally REI that they thought it was. Let's talk about what happens on screen during a walk in the woods. So, um, l- yeah, let's actually let's break this thing down. We're you know I, I said I called it a film shakedown instead of a breakdown. So let's spill this thing on the floor. And uh, and pick up the pieces and, and weigh them one at a time and see what what do we want to keep and what do we want to throw away. Um, and I want to start with right right at the very opening of the movie. And I, I kind of want to take a, a look at this film as like I, I kind of want to try my best to look at it not as a hiker but as a fan of film. You know, a guy who likes to watch movies. But it's so hard because there are so That's many things so in here that as a hiker make me want to go, no, Robert Redford, what were you thinking? <laughs> And and you are like that's part of, I mean yeah. I would I would argue that for all of us here like yep. hiking is now part of our identity. Yep. It's it's not just a hobby anymore. Okay. 
<laughs> so the the opening it's one of those things you can't pull it out of it. You can't you can't look at it objectively. No, no, you can't. We're we're way too close to the source material, so way we're gonna be emotionally involved here. So I hope people will forgive us for being <laughs> so too, emotionally for entangled, being too critical. But you know, from purely as a as a film goer's perspective, here's what here's what we get. the The film opens with Bill Bryson, played by Robert Redford. On an American talk show, and he's sitting there looking embarrassed, uh, you know, almost annoyed, while the the host is sneering at him, uh, you know, saying things like, "Oh, you haven't really written any new books lately, have you? Oh, I see, uh, re-release of old old books, how quaint, you know." Uh, practically, uh, practically goading Bill Bryson into his next project right there on the air, and while he's having this uh, interview with uh, with the talk show host. Uh, this this memorable line from the movie comes up and uh Fozzie, I think this is something uh tell me tell me how you feel about this. Tell me if you think there's any truth to this line. This is from the opening of uh, A Walk in the Woods. Uh what else are you working on? You're writing something new? No. Not thinking of retiring on us, are you? No, oh, no, no. Writers don't retire. We either drink ourselves to death or blow our brains out. And which will it be for you? <laughs> After this interview, maybe both. <laughs> That's audio of Fozzie after his first appearance on Stories from the Trail. And only appearance. <laughs> <laughs> um, I think it's true, the fact that uh, uh, writers never retire. At least I don't ever think I can see myself retiring. But um, mm-hmm. Just kind of run I out of ideas. I thought it was funny when he, uh, at the end of it when he said, uh, uh, after this interview, probably both. But mm-hmm, um, mm-hmm. Yeah, it's... Uh, it's uh, the one bit that did sort of stick in that in that conversation was a bit about uh, writers never retiring. Do you think we'll ever retire, Gary? I I think I already have actually. You're obviously doing a lot better than I am. Then. <laughs> well, no, I mean I don't mean retire as in like never work again, but uh, I don't you know I don't think I have. I currently don't have any other books in the pipeline. So in that in that sense, I'm I'm retired as a as a writer at least, but. Uh, you know, I'm definitely not. I'll never you'll never see me like in a folding chair on a beach with like a drink in my hand going, well, I'm done. You know, there's always going to be something else. But um, I, I I wanted to include that, uh, you know, that clip from that scene, because I thought, you know, as as an opening for a film and the book opens in the, in a similar fashion, it's a little on the nose to have the opening of the book be, well, I'm out of ideas. I guess I'll write this book. You know, I, I think it's it, it's a little I thought I just thought it was an interesting way to start a story. You know, the opening is about the story that you're about to see. I just thought that was kind of uh, an interesting choice, both as, you know, as a as a written work and as a film. OK, so he, he gets this. Obviously, the idea has been planted in his head during this interview. And then in the next scene, uh, Bill goes home to a family who uh, in my notes here, I wrote who appear generic and uninteresting. So we know we've got Emma Thompson playing Catherine. She's a fantastic as- actress, Catherine Bryson, his wife. And basically, we've got, you know, just like some boring looking kids running around a I, i'm just gonna say like a boring looking it looks like the house from home alone you know there's generic kind of hustle and bustle going on in the background like oh i'm late for school oh i'm doing my thing whatever just you know like you can tell right at the right at the scene oh we're never gonna see these kids again they're not part of the story at all they're just kind of set pieces um and then I don't even think we learn their names no, in the movie. No, I don't think we we ever get to. We, there's one brief conversation with his son when they go to REI later, but otherwise the kids are just there to show the audience, like, hey, this guy's got a family. Um, so then they go to a funeral. While they're at the funeral, one of Bill's Bill Bryson's friends makes some kind of remark to him about, uh, uh, you know, oh, kind of makes you feel think twice about slowing down, you know. So now Bill Bryson's got thoughts of his own mortality entering his in, in entering his mind. So they go home after the funeral. And this is one of those things that, you know, I think first thing that goes on our list of here's stuff. They got stuff. They got wrong. They come home from this funeral. They're standing on the porch and uh, Bill says to his wife, I think I'm going to go for a walk. I'll be right back. And he takes like not even 10 steps 
like <laughs> not even 10 steps and he's on the Appalachian Trail like standing there wearing his suit from the funeral he's still wearing his suit from the funeral he you know and there's a sign you know Katahdin this way Springer that way you know they play some music that you know gets you all inspired and then he turns around and walks another what 10 steps and he's back on his porch again I call bullshit yeah, I don't think. I don't um, think that, uh, well, we don't actually. I mean, we don't actually know. For all for well, for all we know, the Appalachian Trail could go through Bill Bryson's backyard. <laughs> I can't watch that. But and I, can I also add that if I, if if at any point I was on the AT and I, I rounded a corner to see a guy wearing a funeral outfit, I'd probably <laughs> turn around and, <laughs> and run. I would think I'd be like, no, that's not normal. That is exactly what I was thinking. Like, when I saw that scene of him walking onto the trail in the funeral outfit, I'm like, man, like, just walking up on somebody dressed like that on trail would freak me out. Yeah, I mean, I don't know about you guys, but if I, I mean, you know, I haven't been to many funerals, but if, you know, when I do get back from a funeral, if I'm going out, I generally change. (laughs) <laughs> that was where it hit me was when he said, "All right, I'm going for a walk," and he mm-hmm. started to walk down the driveway in a suit. I'm like, "Wait, you're not you're not changing? Yeah. Who's gonna?" <laughs> On yeah, I'm when just he comes gonna... back at some point. We see a picture of his road. Like you can see the road. So if he lives right on a road, how does he also live right on the AT? I just don't. It doesn't. Yeah, and it's doesn't. it's like a suburbs road too. It's not like some uh, old dusty country road. He's got like a curb and garbage cans and neighbors and, and oh, and and apparently the AT right there. What, I he, guess I guess like where the AT goes like through the town of Hanover. I guess in theory, it's possible. That's true. That over where it's at by the co-op in New Hampshire in Hanover. I guess it's entirely likely that they were talking about that section, but there's no sign there. Okay. And, 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 trail is so and many miles to, maybe to I'm whatever. being a little Springer. too nitpicky about how close the trail is to his house, because the alternative from a filmmaker's perspective would be to show, you know, 20 minutes of this man who just got back from a funeral, hunched in his black coat, walking against the wind while music plays, you know, <laughs> like a Quentin Tarantino movie, you know, then he gets to the trail and you're like, is it intermission already? Like, no, I guess. Okay. Let's get in there. Probable that one would even think of going, going for a walk in a suit. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> suit, a funeral suit, like a men's suit. But I mean, yep. Okay. So Bill Bryson goes, he, he stares wistfully at the trail for a while. Presumably, you know, like as, as the audience member, we're, you know, we're starting to get the idea like, oh, he's get he's all he's putting it all together now. He's putting it all together. You know, and then he goes home and uh the first thing he does is pitch a tent in his backyard. And the tent is like from the nineteen seven. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, in, in my notes, what did what did I write here? I wrote uh that here he goes for a walk. Oh yeah! After a quick montage of Google imagery, uh, it's suddenly nightfall, and Bill Bryson is in his backyard hammering stakes for what appears to be a Vietnam era Marine Corps issue pup tent. <laughs> <laughs> that is exactly what it yep. looks like. <laughs> and and in, in, but where he tells his wife too that this is what he's going to do. Yes. Yep. Uh, same day. Same same, same day. day. Made, made the whole decision yep. in one day. Yeah. And after. Uh, Taking it to the a, a jaunt to the trail. Yep. And and that conversation sounded like this. Listen, I can't explain. Have a go. It's just something I feel I have to do. I want to explore nature. I want to get back to my roots. Roots? Yeah. You know, push myself. I mean, really, really hike. <laughs> and then she kind of laughs at him after he says it. Um... I felt like as a character, his wife was only there to give him a hard time. I think it's uh, yeah, uh, yeah, possible. I think I, I think it was more sort of concern, but I think that there's kind of an element of of truth in that scene because we all, you know, everybody that's hiked the eighty at some point, you know, tells their wife or their husband or. You know, their mum or their dad or whatever, I'm going to hike the AT. And then there's all the, uh, the the general onslaught of negatives. And, you know, you'll get killed. You'll get raped. You'll get killed right. by a bear. Um, 
and all you know all the self-doubting questions what are you going to eat where are you going to sleep what are you going to do if it gets uh, if it gets wet or it starts snowing i think that's probably some the one situation we've all been through at some point um but yeah she was a bit whingy oh whingy i like that i feel like that was a missed opportunity not just because emma thompson is a, an incredibly good actress but I feel like it was a missed opportunity to really dive into, again, as I said before, the dynamic between two people, whether that be a husband, a wife, it could be, it doesn't even have to be like a couple or a romantic relationship. It could just be with your family or with your friends. I feel like it's a missed opportunity to really dive into experiences like telling your family members that you're going to do this thing and them thinking it's crazy. She just kind of wrote it off. And I feel like it's a missed opportunity to really talk about the discussion that happens between two people instead of just, that she had uh, like oh do you even uh, I think at one point she said have you thought this through at all and that was like the only question he said of course not and I think <laughs> like the next thing he was on a plane like or shopping at REI right. but it was very very little dialogue about the decision making process yeah that's normally one big big conversation um, whoever you yeah. tell it, it normally results in a big conversation so I, I actually included that scene um, uh, among our list of things that the film, I think, got right. Um, and, and while I, I I agree it's a it's a missed opportunity, they could have they could have done more. Um, I, I think it's it's good that they included that scene at all because uh, you know, and Fozzy and and Voldemort both mentioned it. You know, these are very real. This is your first obstacle. You know, before you even set foot on the trail, before you even climb the first mountain, the first thing you have to get past is convincing that you're convincing your family that you haven't lost your mind or maybe that you have and that it's okay. So um, one thing that the film gets right in general is that they, they keep having scenes like this there. There's um, a pretty accurate procession of things we can all relate to. But in in each case, it also you know is a bit of a missed opportunity. You know, some of them, uh, you know, like this in particular, they could have. Uh, I think the the conversation could have been handled a little differently. Or I, I think that what they could have done a better job of was making us miss Catherine once he finally gets on the trail. You know, like she spends so much time trying to convince him that it's a bad idea. Once she finally drops him off at the airport, I've got it in my notes here that I said I was, I'm kind of glad we're not going to see her for a while. Do a, yeah. They do a pretty good job of um, touching on a lot of different people's objections, like showing showing that as a general rule, most people are going to think you're crazy. True. It's almost, um, it's kind of like learning the lesson before you actually get on the trail, if you think about it, because the one lesson or one of the big lessons you, you, you take back from the trail is you don't give up you know, short of having a broken leg or, or you know, or something uh, something drastic happened to you, which you, you do have to cut your hike short. It's the, doing the AT and any of the other trails. It's just it's a lesson in perseverance and, and, and you know, battling your own will to not, not sort of give up all those days where you are having a really hard day and you do just want to go home. It's all about seeing it through. And you do take that lesson back with you. But the first time... You kind of experience that. It's not necessarily when you're out on the trail. It's just getting through the battle of your family and friends trying to convince you not to get there in the first place. Mm, yeah, yeah. So I just I just want to touch on the note of his wife in general. So like she's all she has all this concern for him, and then she just disappears. You don't see her basically until the end of the movie. Right. He makes one phone call and I don't, you, she doesn't answer the call. And then they throw in this other woman. Like it's going to, like he's possibly going to cheat on his wife. Yeah. I'm like, what? The, Mary Steenburgen, um, Ted Danson's wife shows up briefly and we're like, yeah, is he going to, are they going to hook up or, and then she's gone too. Like, they never finished that one. Yeah, th yeah. I mean, they just missed so many opportunities. Like, there should have been a more in-depth conversation about his hike. Like, why the hell did they just throw in a random, hey, he might cheat. Oh, just kidding. He didn't. Like, <laughs> what? Yeah. Yeah, that that seemed like a really odd thing to just stick in the middle of a 
book about or a, a movie about the trail, but uh yeah, it was like a feeble attempt at trying to create drama. Right. Oh, yeah. Yep. Um yeah, I had that in my notes too. Okay, so a- so after he's got his pl- he's you know tries to put his tent up in his backyard and it collapses while his wife is offering objections. In the very next scene, we get him and his son going to you know REI or some you know unnamed outfitter store together, and this is where we run into Nick Offerman, who um, is is always fun. If you're if you've ever watched the show Parks and Rec, uh, Nick Offerman is Ron Swanson. He's uh he's a comedian who basically plays the same character in everything he does. But, <laughs> he's amazing. Yeah. But um they have they have some fun exchanges uh and I caught uh I caught some audio from one that I thought was pretty was pretty entertaining. Let me play this one for you. What I want I want number 5. Oops. No, that's not it. Here we go. No, you know the saying take only memories, leave only footprints. Poop. <laughs> oh shit! Exactly. <laughs> so I, I just I like the fact that we now have an audio clip of Nick Offerman saying "poop." Poop. <laughs> <laughs> I just think that, that's a good a good thing to have. Uh, you know, this might be the first the first uh, sound file in our soundboard. Poop. I think it could be. Poop. Yeah. So, uh, interesting things in the happen in the in the scene at the gear shop. Uh, you know, they throw this, they give him this eighty five liter pack, and then joke that he needs to carry a trowel that weighs point four ounces because he doesn't want to add extra weight. That's all. It's all hilarious. Um, God, the eighty five liter pack. That's just. <laughs> yeah, that yeah. pack was massive. <laughs> it was. Yep. Yeah. So for the, for the first fifteen minutes or so of the movie, you get. Uh, Bill Bryson, you know, deciding to hike the AT and, and gearing up. And it's, it's interesting to me because Robert Redford is a celebrated American actor and, you know, he's, he's a director. And I, I, I feel, I don't know, I feel like he, he, I don't know, he seemed almost bored playing this role. Um, you know, I don't know if he was supposed to be, you know, bored with his life, but, uh, you know, it was coming off to me that he just, his character seemed bored, at least throughout the first 15 minutes or so of the movie. And, uh, things get really interesting though when, uh, his old buddy Katz shows up. So after he finally convinces his wife that it's okay for him to hike the AT and that he's not going to die, she basically gives him the ultimatum. The only way you're allowed to do this is if you bring a friend. So he calls pretty much everybody that he knows from his childhood. No one says yes until he finally gets a hold of uh, good old Stephen Katz. And then that's when we get to meet. Um, uh, oh, uh, that's when we get to meet Nick Nolte for the first time. And for me, this is when the movie really starts to become fun is when Nick Nolte shows up. Hello. Hello. Hey, it's me. I'm sorry. <laughs> just, uh, the way he says hey it's me on the phone there reminds me of uh, uh this is reptar showing up at a shelter hey it's me <laughs> <laughs> nailed it <laughs> <laughs> yeah and then we got uh something else fun here oh so yeah so nick nolte play uh, playing cats i think is just it would absolutely perfect um steve really? i thought so yeah yeah um you know I feel a little differently. Okay, let's hear it. What? What do you? Why do you feel differently? Um, and I, I, I talked to someone else about this, so I'm not the only one who feels this way. But I mean, I did read part of the book, and I feel like Nick Nolte and the way that he portrayed the character was very, very different from what I expected in the book. Did from the book, I think someone who was like younger, and curmudgeonly and more of an oaf okay that is exactly the same way that i was thinking that cats would be played right yeah that's kind of what i i I took him as like a an overweight guy who does drink sometimes and just doesn't know what he's doing and is kind of a dope not like a guy who's looks like he's been through hell and back (laughs) right 
Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Cats. Cats uh, Nick Nolte. I don't know. He just seemed so old and. I mean, I'm not saying that old people can't hike the trail, but he just right. did not seem in any physical shape whatsoever to do it. Really? You don't think so? <laughs> and fun fact, my <laughs> buddy, who has a bunch of friends that work at Amicalola, were there while they were filming it and said between takes, he was actually using like a cane and crutches. Oh, man. To get around. I believe because it. Because he, yeah. So he was like, him hiking is actually him really acting. He's like going through pain to do. Oh, God. Yeah. When he shows up for the first time on film, like his neck is red, you know, like his nose is all swollen. Like he really looks like someone who's been hitting the bottle for 10 solid years. That's, yeah. Yeah. His blood pressure looks through the roof. Yeah. It's yeah. almost like they, um, they, they kind of took, Katz's description or character description from the book, but they kind of exaggerated it like, you know, tenfold. So he's yeah. older than we perceive. Him. Kind of, right? and their exaggeration. He, yeah, he's a lot more on, or he appears a lot more unfit than, you know, you'd, you'd sort of sense he would be from the book. Mm -hmm. um, he's a lot more overweight than you think he would be in the book. He's not as anywhere near as fit as, I mean, he didn't come across as fit in the book, but. You know, when you see him in the movie, I mean, as soon as he gets came across out, as like, capable, though, like capable of walking. Uh -huh. in, yeah, in the book. Not, and yeah. and I didn't I see mean, I didn't see his character capable of walking. Nick Nolte capable of walking like the first <laughs> twenty steps. Uh, you've got a good point there. You've got a point. Yeah, you're, his so Nick Nolte's performance really strains the realism in this film, for sure. Yeah. But it's still a great performance. Yeah, that, exactly. Even if you look at exactly. the picture of, of Stephen Katz, like in real life. Currently, mm -hmm. he looks younger than Nick Nolte looked in the film, and this is after. Yeah, and <laughs> years after the hike. <laughs> it's true. So, yep. yeah, and there's always been a little bit of controversy too surrounding that character as to whether or not Katz was a real person. There was a, a rumor going around for years. In fact, it's still going around that uh, there's two versions of this. There's the rumor that Katz is completely made up. That, you know, whatever ports of the trail Bill Bryson did, he did it by himself, and his publisher or editor suggested hey you should write in a fictitious hiking partner that's one version of the myth the other one i heard is that uh cats is a real person but he's kind of a, com a combination of like two or three of bill bryson bill bryson's other friends into just you know basically a character you know somebody who really went with him but you know all of his various character traits were pulled from other real people i don't know i i, I think both of those are pretty solidly established as as being rumor now i put an article up in the chat uh, that's an interview with somebody whose name is matt angerer uh who is the actual stephen katz so he's a real person but just the character had a different name so he's real but like Fozzie and well pretty much what all you guys said the the version of cats that we get in the movie is nothing at all like what we get in the book um, you know, in the book, I was picturing, you know, just like you guys, somebody a little more buffoonish or almost comical and silly. But the version of cats that we get in the movie is this, you know, big necked, red nosed alcoholic who can barely stand up on his own. This is hang on a second. I have my clip here. This is a clip of uh, this is the version of cats that we get in the book. I'm sorry that we get in the movie. Tell me if you can figure out what's happening in this in this audio. Mm-hmm, yeah. You know, I ate some uh, contaminated peanut thiamines about 10 years ago. You know, totally jacked at my system, you know? What the fuck did he just I say? You said you were in shape. I am. <laughs> what? <laughs> I, I love that because he's eating a donut while he's talking and you just have no idea what he's saying. Yeah, so... Uh, Katz and, and uh, Bill finally hit the trail. And when they do... Let me get back to my notes here because I, I wrote something about this scene specifically. Uh, let's see. They go to REI. We meet cats. Um, oh, okay. So I, I, I think that like everything leading up to the point where Catherine drops Bill Bryson and cats off at the airport is kind of like the first act of the film. And it takes us 30 minutes to get to this point. We're not even on the trail yet. We're already 30 minutes into the movie. And the, the first thing that we get on their experience, and this again goes on to the list of things we've all experienced is 
that shuttle ride to the start of the trail. And right away we get, you know, some creepy Southern weirdo stereotype is how I described it in my, in my, uh, my notes. And the reason I called that out specifically is because that's another common, uh, people who, who tend to criticize the book, especially say that, you know, Bill Brayson relied on stereotypes and platitudes, basically like making fun of the South as a source of his humor. So a lot of people, not necessarily myself, but a lot of people from the Southeast, uh, you know, the Southern part of Appalachia who read that book were actually a little offended by his portrayal of, you know, sort of the slack jawed yokel. And there's a lot of that in the book, not so much in the movie. Um, so they, they get in the cab, they go to, uh, they go to Amicalola Falls Lodge. And first, I got to tell you that scene, uh, you know, they, they play this music. And they have, you know, this beautiful cinematography, uh, the sound, the sound, the score, no, not the score. The soundtrack is a song called She Lit a Fire by Lord Huron. And it's, you know, kind of like this acoustic, echoey, vocal, you know, almost folksy kind of music that goes perfectly with the rolling hills and the backdrops and the scenery. But when, when they, when they stand there at that window at the lodge, looking out at that view, um, I got, I got a little bit of goosebumps. I don't mind saying I got, uh, I got a little choked up at that scene, probably because I was just right there. I don't know. Maybe that was it. But, um, you know, for as much as we like to pick on this movie, there are a lot, a lot of moments like that that really stand out and make me like it. I just want to backtrack a little bit because I think Mm -hmm. you left out something that also bothered me in the movie, which when he was getting the ride to the trail, or to Amicalola Falls, the shuttle driver said, you know, oh, I drive people to trail the time, you know, and they ask him, well, can you tell if somebody's going to make it? And he's like, oh, yeah, mm, definitely, yeah. 100%, every time, you know? And I think that that is a bold-faced lie. Excellent point. Well, yeah. I, don't think, I don't think anybody truly knows. Like, you just can't judge a book by its cover like Nope, you really can't. All right, so I'm going to try to I'm going to try to speed up a little bit here because we're only just now getting on the trail and it's eight o'clock. Um, it's one o'clock. Oh no! <laughs> <laughs> All right, so we so we get on the trail. Did I have any other? Some of us still have to pack for trail days. Oh yeah, that's right. We're we're uh, <laughs> you're you're leaving tomorrow, aren't you? Because you're flying. My Uber is picking me up at my house at four forty in the morning. Oh my goodness. Okay. All right. Well, then let me. Let but me... I'm gonna have brunch and all day in Charlotte to like hang out all day. No, okay. Charlotte is this weekend. Yes. Yeah, Sunday. I feel sad now. <laughs> right. We can we can talk trail days at the uh, at the end of the show. Yep. Okay. So here's here's our heroes finally on the trail, and this is this is their. You know, they're, they're very first steps on the trail. So uh, listen to this and tell me if you can relate to their experience. Sounds like Daniel. You keeping up? Yeah, keeping up. Are we hiking or strolling? What, is this a race? We're trying to do 11 miles. Slow and steady, pal. You want to burn out your legs? Go ahead. Oh, it'd be nice to get there before midnight. Yeah, well, <coughs> that would be nice. So right, right away, right from their very first steps, I think they're they're showing... Uh, you know, the, the struggle that we all have when you're hiking with a partner is that, you know, somebody always wants to hike a little faster or harder than the other one. So they're getting their hike your own hike lesson right there, right there at day one, right there at the start of the trail. So I, I actually included that as a, a, among the list of things I thought they got right. I think they did a good job with that. Um, and then and definitely oh, that first, um, that first kind of day struggle. Um, I was, uh, I mean, I did a fair amount of training for mine. So when I got out there, I was kind of, I was all right from sort of day one, really. But I do remember going up, um, what are they called? The staircase from Amicalola to the top. What do they call that staircase? The wooden thing? 
just the stairs. I, I don't think it has a name, just the stairs. Okay, but I do remember going up that and um, I don't think they were through hikers. I think it was just like, you know, sort of a lot of tourists, but but basically in, in several sort of states of decay, sort of littering that staircase, sort of gulping water. <laughs> it, was, it, um, it was as steep as so it was. poetic, uh, Ozzy. As steep as it was, but um, yeah, there you go. <laughs> Yeah, that staircase is no joke. I went, when I initially hiked the Appalachian Trail, I did not do the approach trail, but I went back later and hiked part of it, including like half of that staircase. And my legs were like shaking after that (laughs) because of like muscle fatigue. Yeah, they certainly throw you in at the deep end. All right, so what do we have next here? Oh, we've got um, this next clip that I want to play for you, I think, um, captures. So it, it seems to me that the audience split on this movie seems to be uh, seems to be age based. And, you know, it could be due to the fact that the lead actor is in his 70s and uh, I think Nick Nolte's in his upper 60s. You know, we've got old people acting in a movie. Um about a story about people having basically old people problems. You know, a lot, a lot of people look at this movie as a, a movie about the Appalachian trail, but I think it's also, or even more so a movie about uh, old friends, old friends having a reunion. And I think that that's one of the reasons why the audience split on this is, you know, older viewers tend to enjoy this movie more, but I also think it has a lot to do with the humor and, you know, things that, that we can relate to. Uh, and I think that this next clip is a good example of that. Oh. Uh, oh. Why? You okay? Yeah, I almost fell out of the log. How far are you figure we got? Oh, about a quarter mile. <laughs> Mother fuck. <laughs> We're going already? No. Oh, oh, oh. <laughs> Can't even get up off the log. <laughs> yeah. And I just I like I just think moments like that is I, I put in my notes, I wrote, This stuff is why older hikers love this movie. And it's and it's true. You know, because that's that's the kind of stuff that we can relate to. I'm I'm getting there, you know, I'm having a little bit of trouble getting out of my sitting spot every now and then. <laughs> All right. All right. Here's another, here's another fun moment. So at this point, so we finally got our, our characters are, are on the trail. And again, I think that this is another, like the next, the next hour of the movie, like 45 minutes of the movie is basically them walking. And you have to admit, like from a writing perspective, whether you're talking about a book or a movie, if, if all your characters are doing is walking, it's very hard to make that compelling, right? So a lot of the things that happen during the next like 45 minutes of the movie, I wrote in my notes that the, the story meanders about as much as our characters do. So we get a whole bunch of scenes in rapid succession of, uh, you know, these two old friends on the AT talking about things that happened in the past or reminiscing about things in their lives. And, uh, and I thought that this, this next clip was a, a rather poignant moment that captured, uh, you know, some of the, the beauty of old friends reminiscing. You remember the Randolph farm? Of course. Super Walmart. now. Christ. The old drive-in theater. Don't tell me. <laughs> Subaru dealership now. No. Yeah, I got my first blowjob there. In the Subaru dealership? <laughs> yeah. Bit of a late bloomer, huh? <laughs> so I think it, uh, that's another thing, too, is people tend to forget just how much uh, how much blue humor and F-bombs there are in this movie. There is a lot of... Um... Yeah, there is a lot of that. I don't remember that from the first time I watched it, but I mean, I got about 15 minutes in and I'm like, there's a lot of like obscenities in this movie. There's Mm -hmm. a lot of derogatory comments towards women as well. And there's a lot of sexual references as well. I don't remember it the first, that the first time I watched it. 
<laughs> yeah. I feel like a lot of it was totally unnecessary. Okay. <laughs> like I don't I don't anything stand out in particular? Well, the thing is like in the book, I don't think that there was anything like that at all. And I feel like again it was just I don't know if it was just a cheap attempt uh-huh. at you know, connecting with some sort of audience or trying to get a laugh or something, but I don't know. I just thought it totally missed the mark. I don't remember it from the book. I don't remember it from the book either. I don't remember that amount of uh, language. Not that it bothers me, but right. I don't remember that from the from the book. And I did. I I I do remember because I only watched the movie this evening again. But I I'm, I was kind of thinking: Is any of this stuff kind of relevant? You know, like the stuff with Nick Nolte in the laundrette with the woman who gets a pink knickers stuck in the laundrette, and then her husband chases her. And I'm like. I'm getting halfway through that, and I'm like, why is this relevant as such? And It felt cheap. Yeah, it's almost like they were trying to kind of like pad it out a little bit. You know, they finish the movie, and they're like, shit, guys, we've only got 70 minutes of movie. We need to <laughs> do some more stuff. Yeah, I, I, I don't remember there being that much um, sexually charged humor in the book. Well, I, I also, I, I agree, it with Reptar and, and Fozzie, it felt like a cheap attempt at connecting with a different audience or making, trying to make the movie stream, I guess, because mm-hmm. apparently cheap stuff like that is mainstream. I don't know, just an attempt to reach a wider audience that it, I, I, and it fell short. So uh, I'm glad you brought up that scene because that, that's one, um, that's a scene that that sticks out in my mind from the book, uh, the the laundromat scene in particular, but for completely different reasons. In the book, uh, Bill Bryson and Katz are doing their laundry, and Bill wants to go to the grocery store for some reason, and I think they're in Parisburg, Virginia. And the reason this sticks out in my mind is because Bill has a very hard time crossing the road. All he's trying to do is get to the other side of the road, and it's like a four lane or six lane divided highway, and you know, he, he climbs under a bridge and like gets covered with mud. And in the book, he writes this commentary about, uh, you know, about how, you know, people are, are paving the wilderness and, you know, cities are an abomination. And, you know, he get, gets a, a little bit, um, all, you know, almost a, a little bit of hey duke on us, you know. And, and when he goes back to the laundromat, Katz tells him this funny story about, oh, I met a lady and, you know, and she said something about her underpants. Ha ha ha. But in the, in the movie, they completely flip the balance on that scene and you get about 30 seconds of Robert Redford, uh, plopping around in what looks like fake quicksand. And then you get a whole bunch of this. What's in it to be the problem? I'm having a difficult time removing my panties. <laughs> well, luckily you're in the presence of an expert. Oh. Um, is it just me or does that lady sound disturbingly like Miss Janet? I was about to say this. I didn't thing. think of that until <laughs> you played the audio and I heard just the audio without seeing <laughs> And then as we were listening to that, I was like, oh, my God, that sounds a lot like Miss Janet. I'm having a difficult time removing my panties. Yeah. I really oh hate Oh, my what's... God. I... That is, like, scary. <laughs> Did they do that intentionally? That's I my... I mean, do not, not like what's happening in my brain right now. Um, here, let's, do, let's hear this. I want to know who's been messing with my Beulah. <laughs> That's the angry husband. I want to know who's been messing with my Beulah. <laughs> I want to know who's been messing with my Beulah. This movie is ridiculous. <laughs> Back to like like people from from the south or the um, southeastern U.S. being upset about stereotypes. I mean, <laughs> so obvious, yeah. and and that. I mean, I don't remember that being in the book. It, it was like it was like two sentences in the book, but it's like this whole big thing in the movie, and it's kind it's of fun. A huge you know, thing. It's kind in the, of fu- in the movie. You know, it's a huge scene. Yeah, 
You know, and if you can kind of forget that you're watching a movie about hiking and pretend that maybe, I don't know, maybe we're in the 80s and our parents are asleep and we've got the VCR and we're about to, I don't know. It's it's just like this, yeah, there's this weird juvenile comedy sensibility about it that just doesn't, it's kind of jarring. Yeah. Or or horrible. (laughs) Yeah. Jarring, horrible. Yeah, yeah. I don't know, but for for some reason, I'm having fun while I'm watching this, though. You know, but I like a I like a good bad movie. It's it's like a watching a a car wreck. You know, you can't <laughs> turn away, but <laughs> you want to. Yep. <clears throat> so so plot wise, what's happening so far is that you know they've been on the trail for a while. Um, you know, we we've stayed at a hotel. We've had our first hitchhike. Uh, oh, there was a scene earlier. So this goes in our list of things that all hikers experience, like things that they got right. So, you know, they had the scene where they run into uh, a talkative, gear-obsessed... Uh, Kristen Shaw, basically, shows up as a, as a you know, one-upper. Uh, you know, whatever story you've got, she's done, she's done more miles. Her gear's better. Um, so they come up with this idea that they have to hike away from her. And that's another one of those things that... Uh, like oh, all hikers can relate to that. We've all you know, we've all been in that situation at some point where we've had to hike away from someone. Can I just we we can can I just rewind? Yes. Very quickly, just yes, go sir. back to the scene that we we'd finish with um, we, the, the underwear one, underwear scene I think again. The only the only good thing to come out of that whole scene when Cass is in the laundrette and the knickers scene. Um, the one thing I did notice about that, and I'm glad they did it, is the fact that Naughty was sitting there in his waterproofs. Oh, I did <sighs> notice that too. Yeah, yeah. That was that was quite <laughs> good. That was that was a nice little uh, a, nice a nice touch. little kind of touch. Mm-hmm. Oh wait, I, I got one for you. Okay, so if you notice, uh, talking about laundromat scenes, apparently one of the laundromat scenes when Robert Redford goes in, he's got his clothes in like a mountain hardware sleeping bag but uh in the bear scene he's actually got an re or uh what is it it's like a big agnes something or other Uh oh cotton ear deer yeah i read that and like some behind the scene fun fact too Hmm. you know what else is seen that robert redford was not wearing his rain clothes but cats was he was wearing like a flannel like a flannel that you would and I, I love the way that, I mean, I don't know what they it looked like. They had two different tents, but I love the way that both of those tents were fitted with the obvious, um, the, <laughs> uh, the extra uh, ability be, to be able to stand up and um, lift the tent with you and walk. <laughs> <laughs> the scene, you're talking about the scene with the bears, right? <laughs> you're talking about the scene with the bear, yeah. I'd love a tent where I can just get up in the middle of the night and, like, you know, if it's raining, I don't have to get out the tent. I hate getting out of the tent to pee anyway, but especially in the rain. <laughs> so I don't know if somebody's invented those tents with, like, two holes in the bottom where you can just lift the no whole thing up. No need to carry a raincoat you know, at all. Yeah. Unzip it. Or whatsoever. Just the tent. <laughs> just the tent, yeah. Stick your tacket out of the entrance hole and, and oh, guys, and, I heard some thunder. Hold on, let me set my tent, <laughs> and then I can continue hiking. Yeah. yeah. <clears throat> so can we can we talk about uh, about this for this scene for a second? Jesus, two fucking bears staring right at me. Oh, damn it, bring some shit. <laughs> The scene with the grizzly bears. <laughs> so you know this happens in you know the the long middle of the movie. Where you know, kind of, we're kind of jumping all over the place here with the middle of the movie, and it and it kind of doesn't matter, you know, like from a storytelling perspective, all of these things happen to to the characters, and it doesn't really advance the story in one way or another. So it doesn't really matter what order they happen in. But so at one point they're they're lying in their tents at night. Uh, Bill Bryson hears a sound, and he says uh, something like, "Hey, hey, hey, cats, are you are you awake?" Cat says, "No," <laughs> and. Uh, they, you know, they, they hear a sound and they go outside and it's fucking grizzly bears. I mean, <laughs> okay. I understand you're making a movie and, you know, if you put a black bear in a movie and you just clap your hands and it goes away, that doesn't make for a very compelling scene in a movie. 
right? You you want to have grizzlies if you're you know if you want the audience to be engaged. But as a hiker, I cannot watch grizzlies on the AT and take it seriously. Yeah, that's that's another one I don't yeah. remember from watching it from watching it first time round. But um, I don't know why they did that. I mean, I, I guess they did it for uh, you know dramatic effect because a grizzly's more dangerous than a or supposedly more dangerous or unpredictable than a than a black or a brown bear. Yeah. But, oh, um, and, and and then you... and then Bill Bryson says, "Oh, they're grizzlies. We should stand up and yell at them." Yeah. Yeah. No. That's not what you do with a grizzly. I'm pretty sure that's that's the last thing you do with a grizzly. That's the thing that you do with the black bears. Mm-hmm. That's right. What do you do with a grizzly? But I also I remember him referencing black bears in in the movie. I don't remember what was before or after that scene. It was not during the scene, but he referenced black bears specifically. I think it's in the scene where his wife is trying to talk him out of of hiking the trail. It was it, yeah, it must have been in the beginning. But he referenced black bears, and then they showed us grizzly bears. So why do you think they did it? Do you think it was Grizzlies just... Grizzlies look more scary. Th- that's the only reason I can yeah, think black of. black bear, you see their tail. Mm. Away. <clears throat> yeah, it was definitely for... Uh, dramatic uh, effect. Dramatic effect. I think in order to tell it like a good hunter story, you, they would have to give more backstory on why black bears can be dangerous give the the viewer an understanding of why it's scary when you see black bear cubs with no mother in the woods Mm -hmm. like to me that's the scariest thing is seeing black bear cubs with no mother between the mother and the cubs but you'd have to explain that and set up a bunch of backstory to get people because a lot of people don't know that that's true. A lot of people don't. I think a lot easier of easier to put don't. a big grizzly bear there standing on its hind legs, growling at you. That's- so, <clears throat> yeah. So you so you bring up an interesting point, Megan. That, that um, you know, we have this decision as you know, as filmmakers, somebody had to make the decision: Are we going to actually teach the audience something here, or are we just going to give them something fun, you know, to watch while while they eat their popcorn? And, and they do a little bit of both in in this movie and like the bear scene is obviously like they sacrificed accuracy for entertainment, but there there's also, you know, quite a few scenes in the movie where they actually do take a little bit of time to try to teach us something. And, you know, I mentioned earlier at the beginning of the episode that that's something that is an area where Bill Brayson really excels. And they made a couple of attempts at that in the movie. Uh, for example, here's, here's audio from the scene where he and cats are, are walking and learning about, uh, about chestnuts. Sure. I'm glad we're not driving right now. <laughs> you, I couldn't be happier. <laughs> you know, 50 years ago, one in every four of these trees was an American chestnut. You know what that is? You ever seen one? I think so. It's incredible. They rise from the forest floor clear to the top 100 feet, and their branches contain an acre of leaves. An acre. You look into these woods, and you think they've always been there and always will be, like this, this old oak tree here. And then you think about the poor, unsuspecting American chestnut and think just in a lifetime, poof, gone. Just like that. So that's, you know, that's some really thoughtful stuff to throw in a movie that has, you know, somebody removing their panties in a, in a laundromat. Yeah, I thought that that was actually nice that they added some of that in there to kind of offset the unneeded blowjob talk. I don't know. <laughs> right. Yeah. No, is that actually true about the um, American chestnut? Was it what he was saying? Was it, is that true? It is. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, it's and it's really sad too. But um, yeah, maybe talking- there's a kind of like an underlying message that you know uh, you can people think you can do these 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 adventures anytime, or you know the woods will always be there. But uh, yeah, you really have to appreciate. Uh, Wild. Some of those trees don't don't survive. Horse chestnut's a classic example, isn't it? Mm-hmm. Yep. So, you know, and I think, I think you know, it's 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 good that they included things like that in this movie, 
and I, I'm kind of, and on one hand, I'm sad that there wasn't more of it. But again, from, you know, a purely filmmaker's perspective, you know, if you're trying to get as many, you know, seat, seats filled in the theater, you know, you put too much of that stuff in and now you've got a documentary. You know, people, uh, you know, I, I, they, they want to be entertained and educated, but you know, you don't want too much of one or the other, I guess. Um, I don't want, <laughs> I don't want to go to a movie to learn. I'm here to have fun. But, um, you know, stuff like that's hard to put into a movie and have it still be entertaining too. You know, I mean, uh, Robert Redford is basically, you know, reading line for line from the original book when he, when he delivers that. So it's not very dialogue friendly. Your choices are either, you know, one character lecturing to another or voiceover. So too much of that and people, you know, tend to go, I don't think I, I don't think I want to watch this. But I'm glad they put, I'm glad they put some of that in. I think there could have been a little bit more though. That's just me though. All right. Well, it's like kind of, you know, talking about kind of making it a, a documentary in a way. Mm-hmm. I feel like what they've done is, kind of alienated every possible market for the movie to actually work. Like the comedy I don't feel is good enough to stand on its own to people that wouldn't hike the Appalachian trail and the people that are actually interested in the Appalachian trail. I feel like it kind of got bogged down with a bunch of, you know, old men in laundromats chasing (laughs) yokels. I don't know. (laughs) Okay. I think definitely if you're looking at that movie for research on the Appalachian Trail, you're not going to take anything away that's going to help you. Yeah, not at all. Except for maybe McAfee Knob. Getting oh. a good look at that. Yeah. And Amicola Fall. Yeah. The cinematography in those two scenes in particular. Yeah, I know there were a lot of good, there were a lot of drone shots, but man, when they showed McAfee Knob from above and behind, you know, you always see that that standard view. Uh, but when they, you know, showed the view from the knob, I, it was another one of those moments where I got chills. I'm glad they did stuff like that too. They had, uh, they had to show that really, didn't they? I mean, it is, I mean, don't they say McAvey's knob is the most photographed location on the hunt, the entire trail? It is. Yeah. They had to show it, didn't they really? Yep. But, but to your point, you know, they were kind of all over the place. You know, you get, we're going to learn about chestnuts. We're going to get a little bit of, you know, juvenile humor. We're going to see some beautiful photography. Uh, and I, I captured one more example, uh, of something, uh, a few lines from cats. And in my, in my notes, I wrote Academy Award winning performance right here. And it, you know, it struck me, Fozzie, you mentioned at the beginning that we had some really bad acting in this movie. And I thought we did. There's, there's no doubt about it. There are some lines in here that are just painfully delivered, but there was, there were a few things in here that I thought were actually like genuinely good performances. And I want you to, you know, listen to cats talking about his alcoholism and, you know, try to pretend that this isn't in a movie about hiking. Pretend that you're listening to, you know, like this is a movie that's up for an Academy Award. I mean, there's just this hole in my life where drinking used to be. I know I can't drink. Only one drink will lead to ten. And the next thing I'll find myself underneath a bridge somewhere. And I thought that was some like some powerful moving stuff, right? But also kind of out of place. You know, like that, I think so, like that belongs in another movie. It, it's, it's, you know, again, that, you know, like that and like the panty humor. I don't know. Maybe, maybe I'm, I'm a bit prudish about my hiking movies, but I want them to be about hiking. Damn it. I agree with you. It was, yeah. um, it, it was one of the few moments in the, in the movie that is quite kind of poignant. And I think people mm-hmm. that have had, uh, alcoholic issues or probably, um, can probably relate to it. It is it is quite a poignant part, but yeah, I, I agree with what you say. It is kind of, you know, just I don't know. You can't kind of sort of judge the relevance to the movie. Maybe it's just kind of like you know people that age, and it's just you know reflecting on mm. stuff. And I guess 
you know, alcohol's a big topic, isn't it? Maybe it's yeah. uh, and and we, and we get some of that as you know part of Katz's character arc. You know, he starts the movie by sneaking a whiskey bottle into his pack. You know, later, in fact, in the scene we just heard is when, you know, he's telling Bill Bryson that he brought that whiskey bottle not to drink, but to remind him why he doesn't drink anymore. And, you know, and it's, and it's this, it, it's a, it's a beautiful story and it's, you know, it's personal and poignant. But again, you only get, you know, if you take all of those scenes and combine them into their own, own film, it's barely three minutes of the film. It's like they're trying to tell six different stories all at once and not committing to any of them is kind of how it feels. I just, you put that. I just want to point out that we still have not heard from his wife up to this point. <laughs> no. Yeah. yeah, exactly. Except for there's one scene in a hotel. Like you said, he called her, got the voicemail and that's it. So yeah, no, no contact from home. Poor Emma Thompson. Yeah. <laughs> so in addition to, you know, kind of being a hodgepodge of multiple different stories. I also felt it, it was kind of difficult for me to figure out what the structure of this movie was. Um, you know, while I was taking my notes, I was trying to divide what was happening into, you know, is it three acts? You know, is it five acts? There's, there's a, 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 a storytelling template that's very famous. Uh, you know, writers are familiar with something called the hero's journey uh, and none of them really apply. What we get here is like a, a kind of a rushed beginning where, you know, our hero gets this idea. He's got to get to the trail as quickly as possible. He gets on the trail. Uh, you know, according to my notes, again, they kind of meander for about 45 minutes to an hour. And then the end of the movie just kind of comes out of nowhere too, which I guess that's going to be the case when you don't really have a plot. And and I don't mean and I'm trying not to be mean when I say that you know but it really doesn't have a plot you know it's just they, they walk a bunch of a bunch of different places, so and the ending just kind of comes out of nowhere, and what happens is they you know they have I guess what amounts to their first really bad day on the trail, when uh, near the end of the film we find our heroes on some weird cliff that is unlike anything I've seen anywhere on the AT they're basically like clinging to the side of like a sheer rocky cliff that looks like it's something out of an Indiana Jones movie. Like I have no idea where they're supposed to be. And they topple over the edge and they drop about 50 feet and they land on a ledge and they spend an entire day and a night on this ledge. And they get a lot, you know, a lot of time presumably to consider whether or not this whole thing was a good idea. We are fucked. Monumentally. We are fucked. Monumentally. So they spend the night on on this ledge and uh, essentially decide to go home. Right? Like, that's it. Like, they, you know, they've been through all of this together. Uh, on the ledge, they have a conversation in which they basically decide that their their hike is over. But before before they, you know, before they can end their hike, they have to get rescued. And I wanted to play this one last clip of audio for you from their rescue because it's funny. Hang on a second. Number 26. Okay, so here are our heroes being rescued. Hey, down there. You're going to be shit. What happened to your pants? Uh, that's a long story. Copy that. You guys stay put. We'll get you out of there. <laughs> okay. My, my favorite part of that scene is the guy who says... Story. Copy that. You guys stay put. We'll get you out of there. Copy there. Copy that. You guys stay put. It sounds like he didn't get it right and they just went with the first take. But who says copy that? Do you guys ever say that? I can't say I haven't used it. Well, I have used it at some point, but I don't make a habit of it. No. <laughs> the only time put it in text messages, but not like in words that come out of my mouth. I think it's used to, they used to say it on CB radio. I remember the, I do unfortunately remember as far back as CB radios, and we used to use it then. But um, yeah, I can't. Uh, if I was stuck on a ledge and a guy said uh, that was rescuing me, said copy that, then I'd, I'd be slightly worried. I think about my rescue. <laughs> <laughs> you have to have a, a walkie-talkie in your hand while you're saying those words. Yeah. 
Yeah, that, so that that, oh, that brings up something I wanted to talk about because it was in my notes, but we didn't get to it. It was the way all of the sort of background hikers were portrayed in this movie. Like anybody who was supposed to be a through hiker, uh, how do you how do you feel they did it with the accuracy of uh, of portraying us? Um, not particularly well, to be honest. Um, well, um, it was shit, really, wasn't it? To be <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, uh, I can kind of I can kind of relate to the what's the the woman that they were trying to get away from at the beginning? Um, Mary Ellen. Mary Ellen was yeah. it? Kristen Shaw. Um, there was kind of you know elements of truth in the you know one of those people that you do sort of want to you just don't want to sort of hike with and you just you just dying to get away from. But um, I remember that when they're trying to cross the there was kind of like a sort of like a. a not a river, but kind of like some waterfalls and they're debating how to get across it. And the two guys come up behind them, ask them if they want a hand over that, that I found a bit kind of strange. Cause they look like two kind of people that have just come out of the gym, like kind of like yeah. bodybuilders or something. And hiking Ma in the didn't. chat, I mean, said basically- they were nobody- clean exclamation point. Yeah. Nobody <laughs> in that movie really looked, nobody looked like, through like a through hiker, but, yeah. If they made them look like through hikers, then I suppose you'd kind of alienate the people that don't, or the, the the majority of the population that don't sort of know how a through hiker would kind of look. But yeah, unless I don't they'd think... put in the work to show how a through hiker gets that way in the beginning. Yeah, to so show the community aspect would, of it and their relationship super, with other people. Super realistic, no. Yeah, any any time you saw a hiker in the background of any scene, whether it was the the restaurant at Amicalola or in that scene where they're crossing the stream, or the people who rescued them, they all look like um like mannequins from uh from an outfitters. <laughs> there was one guy I think they actually did an okay job of making look like a hiker, and that was at uh, mountain crossing. I, kn- I knew you were going to say the dude at Neil Gap. Oh, the yep. guy with the dog sitting the on the, the picnic table. Yep. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, the, yeah. The only real hiker in the movie. <laughs> yeah. yeah, honestly, it's probably true. Yeah. That was, I so, mean, that was actually Neil Gap, so it probably was actually a through hiker. Yeah, so they, were, like, they were just like, "Do you want to be in the movie?" And he was like, "Okay." <laughs> uh, they were like, "Oh, you need to clear out. We're filming." And he's like, "I'm not moving, dude." <laughs> 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 No nah, man, I'll stay here for a bit more. Thanks, though. Yeah. It's almost like the re- the guy or the the girl that was in charge of research for what through hikers look like didn't uh-huh. have a very high budget. You know, he was kind of like he got all the extras that are in the movie and said something along the lines of, "Here's two hundred dollars. Go down to REI and buy some gear and come back." Yeah. Talking <laughs> about budget, they spent eight million dollars to make that movie. I don't know where. Well, apparently, and Emma I Thompson also read, maybe maybe on the acting. The, uh, on the <laughs> yeah, right. Robert Robert Redford was what five million of that five budget. million of the whole budget. But uh, I actually read somewhere that they used camels to what? haul gear up the trail for them at times. What that was in some yeah that was in some like Hollywood Reporter. You know, you know that's insane. You know other. you know who else will do that for you. Hikers who have just finished through hiking the trail and don't want to go back into the real world, you pay those people, they will they will carry things for you. Sure I bet does. I bet you. Right? I'm just wondering where do you get a camel out there? <laughs> I don't know. I need where somebody you somebody needs to fact check that one. I don't know, man. Yeah, it's it sounds a little it sounds like I, kind of fake. I know so, we do you're um, definitely fact check alpacas here in the Appalachians Appalachians uh no camels it's a pack though. animal yeah right I guess if, if it's in the Appalachians they're alpacas right <laughs> glad somebody that was, so bad. <laughs> that was wasn't uh, it? that's one of my worst um, <laughs> Appalachian right. next next thing up on my list is the is the words let's go home because that's kind of just how the, the movie just kind of ends out of nowhere. Like they literally just I'm say, for that. let's go home after they get pulled off of this ledge. And then let's see here. Here's how it says in my notes. Um, Hiker bros to the rescue again. Now suddenly they want to go home. Now we're in a truck. Boom. We're in a cab. 
boom, we're on a bus <laughs> and that's it. Like that's so anticlimactic. Yeah. Like it just, it happens like boom, boom, boom. Like they're on the cliff and, and it's that weird. Like you still think you're in the middle of the movie. You still think you're in that part where like, Oh, right. okay. After they get, what's going to happen next. And in the very next scene, they're in a, in a cab and then on a bus and that's it. So they, they just kind of wrap it up out of, out of nowhere. Uh, they do have, uh, you know, like one last little friendly exchange with each other as they're, uh, you know, as they're on that last shuttle ride home. And, uh, this is audio that any, any hiker who's seen this movie is familiar with this audio. I'm going to play this. This is our last clip from the movie. We weren't even close, were we? What are you talking about? We did it, Bryson. We never even laid eyes on that photographer. Another mountain? How many mountains do you need to see? <laughs> That's one way of looking at it. That's the only way of looking at it. As far as I'm concerned, we walked the Appalachian Trail. We walked it in the heat, we walked it in the snow, we walked it until our feet bled. We hiked the Appalachian Trail, Bryson. And that's the line that gets everybody fired up. We hiked the Appalachian Trail, Bryson. So I think in in the book version, um, Bill had to leave the trail twice. Like he got partway through Virginia and then he had to leave for six weeks for part of a book tour and then came back. And I think like yellow blazed up to New Hampshire, did like another hundred miles and then called it quits. And then in the movie version, we're still not entirely sure where, where they were when they left the trail, because there's a lot of things like it, it, you know, in the montages that they show separating the scenes, you'll see things that you recognize, but not in the right order. Like they go from, uh, you know, like they go from, like they're, they're clearly in Roan Highlands and then they walk past a sign that says, welcome to the Shenandoahs. And, you mm. know, like at one point, I think Bill, Bill Bryson's character is standing on top of a mountain and he, and like he points, he points off in the distance and he goes, look, the Smokies. And then they just walk off in some other direction. So you didn't like you I'm not really sure where they were, <laughs> but the movie's over and they go home. So that's it. Like it just kind of comes out of left field. Um and then we get about like five more minutes after that. Uh Bill Bryson goes home and in one of the last scenes of the movie, he surprises his wife on the porch. So he comes home, she's standing there, I don't know what she's doing on her porch, but she looks up and is just amazed to see him. Um Shouldn't she have been at the bus station or shouldn't he have <laughs> like maybe called? Right. That's the other thing that, that gets me. Like he didn't even tell his wife like, Hey honey, I almost died. I'm coming home. Like what? <laughs> Gary, as someone who hiked the Appalachian trail while married, <laughs> mm-hmm. being someone who was with you quite a bit of that time, mm-hmm. I have an understanding of the communication with your wife, but yeah. how does your communication with Katie uh, differ from the communication that Bill Bryson's character had? It exists. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think that's... <laughs> There's your own, so... Back me up on that... this one. We're still in love, right? Yeah. Okay, she says yes. <laughs> That was great. <laughs> yeah. Still in love, right? <laughs> oh, great. Guys, I'm in love. <laughs> yeah. I, I don't know. There, yeah, there's a, there's a big difference. I actually love my wife. I don't know. It's just, it really, <laughs> no, it really seemed like he was glad to be away from her. Like it just, I, I it, it seemed like he was really, uh, he was put upon. Yeah. I don't, and I, and I know I, I'm, I'm, fairly certain that's not the case in real life i mean i hope that's not the case in real life but um yeah i was kind of annoyed by how little depth they gave uh you know basically the only female character in the movie yeah i mean don't forget about beulah <laughs> i feel like beulah might have had a little bit more depth than his wife <laughs> well <laughs> oh geez what, what are we doing here nothing Nothing good, Gary. Okay. <laughs> Talking about underpants. Okay. So, okay. So he, he goes home. He surprises his wife on the, on the porch. Um, you know, they have this loving, loving reunion. And then there's a, a nice little scene that wraps up the movie 
uh, you know, Bill Bryson sits back down at his desk. He's got a big stack of mail that's waiting for him. I guess, you know, nobody took care of anything while he was away, but he's going through his, his stack of mail and it's all the postcards that, uh, that cats sent him while they were hiking on the trail together. So it's kind of like, you know, in the, the sitcoms from the eighties, you would get during the closing credits, you would get like, Oh, here's a, you know, like a fro, a freeze frame of, scenes from earlier in the show that's what we get here in the form of these postcards that he's going through and it's you know cats reminding him about the time that they were in the rain together and then remembering the time they ran into that lady with the big underwear yeah they keep bringing that up um you know and then the very last postcard cats asks bill bryson what's next and and uh it, and in a really cheesy moment of just cinematic wtf you know bill <laughs> bill Bry- bryson kind of like strokes his chin and nods and goes hmm like opens his laptop and types the words a walk in the woods and then we fade to credits so much cheese uh so much cheese it's like they realized that they hurried the end of the movie and that they kind of abruptly stopped it and they wanted mm-hmm. to tie it up in a bow and their bow was that scene I think you're right. I think you're you're right. Yeah. It was a shitty bow. Yeah. Um, Yeah. So it's it's like they had the last part of the movie figured out before having the rest of the movie figured out. Yeah. They're like, all right, we're going to base this whole movie on him writing this on the screen. (laughs) This montage of postcards and then him writing these words on the screen. All right, that's what we've got, guys. Make a whole movie. (laughs) I need the whole middle part based on this. I've got it. Beulah. (laughs) Beulah. (laughs) Beulah. (laughs) Ah. Okay, so and and there we have it. That is A Walk in the Woods. Um, A harshly critical review of... Again, so I, I want to. I just kind of want to summarize how I how I felt about it. And um, actually, you know what? When, do you do you guys mind taking a few minutes to just do like a quick summary of, you know, like thirty seconds or so, like your summary of basically how you felt about it? Would you recommend it? If so, to who? And you know, just kind of final thoughts, and then I'll I'll do mine after you guys. Google says that eighty eight percent of Google users like this movie. Oh, I do not believe that. <laughs> But I'm not buying it. Um, I, I'm I'm not a I'm just not a fan. I pr- if, even though I didn't finish the book, I still prefer the book because at least we got more depth. I know that it's always a struggle when you take uh, something something in writing, uh, like a novel or anything like that, screenplay, even those things, and trying to like push them into a short movie. That's you know, you, you don't have a lot of time right. and I feel like we're not, we just don't go into depth as much as, as I would like for the hiking community. I don't think it satisfies that group of people. And as far as just like a non, a person who's not a hiker who doesn't know the hiking community, I feel like there's just not enough meat in the movie to make it interesting to those people either. I think it's it, meant to appeal to them is cheap shots. In order to truly capture a through hike on on screen, I think it's got to be uh, two ten episode seasons on Netflix. I Does think, it also need to be called "Where's the Next Shelter"? Oh yeah, I think that would be a great one. Yeah, I think that would be an awesome <laughs> yeah. ten um, episode, two a ten episode season or a, shows, whatever on Netflix. Well, we'll work I'll on it. it. Yep. Um, <laughs> yeah, it just it doesn't. There's not yeah. enough time to go go into depth there. Uh, so, Fozzie, any parting parting shots, parting <laughs> thoughts or shots? Thoughts or shots? Yeah, I'm 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 a bit I'm disappointed that they didn't carry Bryson's humor from or clear humor in the book over to the to the movie. There's nothing about in the movie why I kind of like reading. Bryson and his angle on stuff. There wasn't any of that in the movie. It was a bit, as we said, it was a bit disjointed. There was a lot of scenes that almost kind of like didn't really have any bearing, which were all sort of stitched together um, to make this movie. There's no real sort of clear message. I didn't really sort of take much away from it. But, I mean, having said all of that, you know, if somebody said, should I watch this movie, I would probably say, yes, it's not going to blow your world, but... 
you'll probably you know enjoy it. it's a bit of sort of light-hearted humor but uh let's face it it's not going to go down as a as a classic okay fair enough um so reptar as a as a filmmaker yourself uh do you prefer the blu-ray or 4k version of this movie <laughs> <laughs> oh man yeah i mean we all know how i feel about it i think (laughs) and you know i actually will say that there are a few things that i did like about the movie uh the scene where he's talking about the trees and whatnot i thought that was really good the i did like the really annoying chick the one upper chick i thought they could have probably thrown her in there a little bit more because mm-hmm. I just thought that that was a funny character, uh, and she's a comedic, a, a comedic genius too, Kristen Schaal. Oh my god, she's yeah. amazing. Yeah, she's awesome. Uh, and another thing that I I thought that they kind of got accurate that we didn't mention was when they go and stay at the hostel. Guy that kind of creep. He's like, "Hey, what do you think about that XR? Blah 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 blah. I got the blah blah blah. Gregory yeah, because, yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, and and." It, it's funny because there are people like that actually on trail. Yeah. <laughs> you know, that'll be like, Hey, what do you think about this? And you're like, I don't know. It's just a tent. You know? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. What, 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 what's your tent? Oh, I have the New Year's. Blah, blah, blah. Which one's yours? The orange one. <laughs> yeah. You know? But, uh, no, I think if somebody asked me, should I watch the movie? I wouldn't say no. I just, let them know what they're getting into. Okay. Like you were saying, if they're looking to get advice about hiking, it is definitely not even remotely close in that regard. And if you know you just want to put something on in the background, maybe while you do some laundry, yeah, go for it. <laughs> <laughs> is that how you watch this? While yes. you're while you're doing laundry. That, and that is actually what I did today. Oh, yes, okay. I was doing my laundry while I watched it. <laughs> actually, stared intently and took notes. This I'm is sorry. The, this is like painful. this is my version of uh, of Megan on the Leave No Trace episode. <laughs> yeah, um, yeah. The the book version of uh, of A Walk in the Woods will always hold a special place in my heart because it's the first book that I read about the Appalachian Trail. Um, it wasn't how I learned about the trail. I'd already, you know, I already knew that it was a real thing, but it was the first, my first real look at the trail, which I think is the case for a lot of people. You know, I was an, I was a, not even a casual hiker, just kind of a, a non hiker, you know, and this, this book gave me a, a glimpse, even if it wasn't an accurate one, it gave me a tiny sense of what might be possible out there so you know it really did it did kind of inspire something in me and it wasn't until years later i think the second book i ever read about the at was uh a wall's book which came out in 2008 so about 10 years apart but uh the movie version of a walk in the woods will always hold a special place in my heart because it is my mother-in-law's favorite movie (laughs) and um uh becky who is in the chat with us this evening sent this incredibly long list, and I shouldn't say incredibly long because that makes it sound, uh, this incredible long list of questions that are actually pretty thought provoking, um, you know, that go into a lot more depth than we, you know, we, we would need the show to be another hour long to, you know, to go into any of these questions. But maybe what I'll do is I'll, I'll uh, copy and paste these into a post either in our Facebook group or on our Patreon or something so that you guys, you know, if you can't get enough of this movie, maybe you can look at it and think about it a little more. It's quite, you know, questions like which character do you relate to the most? Um, you know, or as far as Bryson's reasons for hiking the trail, which ones made sense to you and which ones didn't? She's a teacher. So a lot of these are really good discussion style questions. And I'm sorry we didn't get a chance to, to get to them tonight. But as far as the movie goes itself, you know, if somebody asked me, should I watch this movie? I think rather than just giving a straight yes or no, I would take a little bit of time to, to get to know the person who's ask, asking the question because there are certain people who are just going to be, you know, completely put off by all the cheese or the juvenile humor while other people are just going to, you know, just going to love the relatability of some of these characters and the scenery. So, you know, there's really, uh, you know, there's a lot to like. There's also an, a lot to not like, depending on how you go into it. If you're looking for something that's going to teach you or prepare you uh, for a through hike, this is not 
this is this movie is not going to do that uh, but like reptar said if you want something that's definitely going to entertain you while you're folding laundry i cannot argue with that um you know as cheesy and as as lame as this movie is in some places and we've had some fun poking fun at it um you know i enjoyed watching it so uh definitely not the the best or most accurate movie about the at but it certainly can be fun uh and that's uh that's my take on a walk in the woods and i just want to add you know, as much as I think the movie is horrible, the book, <laughs> I would recommend people actually read the book because I think the book is a good read. It wasn't necessarily my cup of tea, but I thought it was well done mm-hmm. and much, much more so than the movie. So I don't I don't want to completely crap on A Walk in the Woods as a whole. <laughs> yeah, I agree. I The from what I read of the book, the at least the beginning part of the book, um, information, the facts that were in there, and the humor was different. If someone were to ask yeah. me about it, I would definitely steer them yeah. towards the book. Yep, and and like I said before too about the you know some of the things that that really stand out about Bill's writing style is that he does a great job of teaching, but you know whenever it comes time to you know, to be humorous, he, 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 re, he resorts to complaining, which I think is kind of like low hanging fruit. But other than that, I think Bill does a good job uh, as a writer. I give him, I you, give him high you marks. You on a first name basis with Bill? <laughs> uh, no, certainly not. Um, uh, Bill refers to me as Mr. Sizer. Or <laughs> not Sergeant? <laughs> at least, at least his, his, his attorneys do in their legal correspondence. <laughs> <laughs> in their cease and desist letters. <laughs> Yeah, Bill. Well, they will be after this podcast. <laughs> Calling him Bill all night, like we're like we're drinking buddies. <laughs> oh God. Oh boy. Oh, guys. Are all we right. gonna get in legal trouble for talking about them? Uh, so we're we're not, and this is something that I actually looked into before we before we started recording. Uh, is there something called fair uh, fair use clause in copyright law? That as long as we're using materials for uh, educational or purposes of criticism or you know, like film critique, we can do you know, like we can talk about copyrighted materials and play small, small audio clips. I, I downloaded a checklist from a legal library to make sure. Wow. Yeah. You have been is... busy doing research. <laughs> yeah, you have. You have done your research. You. Good job. Well, a lot of a lot of work goes into this. My heart yeah, goes no, out you... to you, Gary. I'm very impressed, mate. You did do yeah. a very good job. You should come back um, you. come back on next week. You could be a regular <laughs> or something. <laughs> well, thanks, Fozzy. Uh, where, where do I apply? <laughs> no, good job, mate. I'm impressed. <laughs> well, thank you. I, I certainly appreciate it. Um, yeah, the, the show is fun, but the show is also, it's also a lot of work. We put a lot of time into this before we record and a lot of time after we record and one of the things that helps us keep doing that is support from listeners like you a whole lot of people have been going to patreon.com slash stories from the trail and making sure that we can keep doing this um, i hope if you're listening you'll consider doing that too all right well we, we've gone way over time we're a half an hour past what time we usually press stop so uh big thanks for everybody who stuck around a little bit late i know we went long uh I appreciate it. You're welcome. <laughs> <laughs> wow. Not only have we overrun, I haven't even so done So serious. Am I going to be uh, doing wild? Yeah, I don't. I don't know. We'll we'll see. Um, we've al- we've already started receiving lists of people suggesting other hiking movies. So maybe we'll do wild next. Maybe we'll do. End up being watching movies all the time. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. I, I, don't, I don't know how often we'll do this, but uh, you know, this was this was definitely fun. That was a fun assignment. Yeah. Well, thanks everybody. All right, thanks guys. I gotta go eat. Good night. Stories from the Trail is a production of the Trek Co. Zach Davis, editor in chief. Each episode is recorded in front of a live internet audience. Uh, You can be part of that internet audience if you care to join us on Wednesday nights at 7 p.m. Eastern. Uh, There's a link in the show notes that tells you everything you need. Our music is by Lee Rosevere. Your hosts are Green Giant, Voldemort, and Reptar. Reptar. 
You can find us on social media, Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, all those places. Just look for stories from the trail. It's probably us. The show is recorded, mixed, and edited by me, Gary Sizer, in Blanket Fort Studios, which is just me in my basement with a blanket over my head. Thanks for listening. <laughs>